This is a CME accredited event. There are no commercial sponsors for this grand round. Disclosures were reviewed and no conflicts of interest were found. So thank you everyone for, for coming this morning. Many of you had the opportunity to listen to Dr. Kurth about urinary reflux yesterday, but for those of you that did not, Dr. Kirsch completed his urology residency at Columbia and then went on to do his pediatric urology fellowship at CHOP. When he graduated in 1998, he headed off to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Emory, and Georgia Urology and has been chief of pediatric urology there since 2003. Uh, Dr. Kirsch has published on a whole breadth of different topics in pediatric urology, but the folks at CHOA, both urology and the pediatric radiology group have really been at the forefront of MR urography. And Dr. Kirsch is gonna to speak to us about that today. So welcome. Okay, well, good morning. Uh, thank you very much again. It's been a great couple of days here. I really uh, enjoyed meeting all the, uh, the residents, the, um, the fellows and the staff. So thank you very much. Let me go ahead and start here. So uh, this morning I'm going to talk about MR urography. Um, I've had the privilege of working with a great group of uh, pediatric radiologists in Atlanta um, where we uh, developed a lot of the technology that's being used for this. And so we've been involved with this for probably the last 12, 15 years um, and really have found it to be an amazing uh, technique to evaluate the urinary tract. So. The objectives um, of this talk are really to determine how we um, define obstruction. And that's been a problem um, in our field forever. You would think that if you put a nephrostomy tube in the kid and you did a pressure flow study, that would be the best way to evaluate obstruction. It just doesn't happen that way. It's a very complex process. Um, so we're trying in the, in, in the field of pediatric urology is to, is to take a fetus um, and then figure out if their hydronephrosis that's detected during fetal life at various uh, gestational ages, is this gonna be something that we need to worry about? And that's really the main question we have. And so we're gonna look at the role of MR urography in the management of congenital obstructive neuropathy. So um, a little background, you know, we use fetal sonography. Uh, it's, it's the easiest, safest, uh, cheapest tool that we have to evaluate hydronephrosis. We start to see kidneys at about 12 weeks gestation. Usually at this time, we don't see any evidence for, for hydronephrosis because the kidneys are simply growing at that time. By 24 weeks, we could see mild hydronephrosis in a small percentage of patients. Uh, and then it makes sense that since the urine is being made up in the kidneys, it's gonna drop into the bladder. That would be the next thing we would see. And that's visible about uh, 14 weeks gestation. And by term, the, the fetal, the, the uh, newborn bladder is about 50 cc's. And then um, you, when you uh, go for your first ultrasound, uh, that's usually done about 20 weeks. And at that time, you can usually get a sense of whether there's a male uh, or a female uh, fetus. So three-dimensional ultrasound, I'll just mention this quickly. I mean, this is, this is what we want to see. We want to see these details, but really this is, done mostly in, in malls throughout the United States. And you know, you, you get topography, you could go in and get your baby picture done uh, and pay and get a little postcard thing made up um, like this. Um, but you don't really see inside the fetus. So plastic surgery is like this because you can see a lot of the facial anomalies um, and um, surface uh, wall anomalies. So just to, re to review the anatomy while that little video is going, um, we remember the ureteric bud is coming off of the mesonephric duct, induces the metanephric blastema, and there's lots of branching. And this video kind of shows you this branching process. Um, so by the end of the um, process, you can see that the newest uh, of the branches are all in the periphery. And um, the reason why this is important, especially um, if you enjoy embryology and pediatric urology is that a lot of the patients that we see look like this. And so they, they are developmentally delayed uh, in their kidneys. So I'll show you MR urography 
uh, role in this, but if you just kind of remember this picture, and I'll get back to this again, is that when you see a kidney that looks primitive, it's because it did have some developmental arrest and probably is associated with, with renal, <laughs> renal dysplasia. So we have a way of speaking to each other uh, about hydronephrosis through the Society for Fetal Urology Grading System. There's no perfect system out there, uh, but in this system, the dilatation that you may see in the calyces is the most important thing. Um, and if you just kind of remember that um, the grade three and four, the moderate to severe levels of hydronephrosis, those are probably the only important ones. Um, and some, some classification systems have taken those two and divide them up into, into separate uh, classes. But these are probably anatomic variation, the lower grades of hydronephrosis. They typically will go away. So when you're looking at what causes moderate to severe hydronephrosis or grade three to four SFU grade hydronephrosis, clearly the most common is UPJ obstruction. Reflux, UVJ obstruction, or mega ureter um, are also seen, but UPJ, UPJ obstruction is clearly the most significant. So what is obstruction? How should we define this? Well, we know this is an imbalance between flow and drainage, um, but it's really quite complex. There's a lot of pathophysiology involved. And today there's really no clinically useful classification system. There's no consensus about who could be watched, who needs surgery, and how do you know that surgery was even successful after you do it? Um, so you would think we would be way further ahead, but we really are not. And this is just a, um, flow chart to show you the pathogenesis. It involves stretching um, of the renal parenchymal tissue, and then a process of programmed cell death, inflammation, and fibrosis, which eventually lead to interstitial fibrosis, tubular loss, and nephron loss. Um, so we're going to try to figure out how the MRI urography could help us determine uh, which kids with hydronephrosis are obstructed, um, and um, what their pathophysiology is. So who needs surgery? Uh, again, there's not a great consensus um, and reports are typically contradictory. We use something called a half-life, uh, uh, the half-life, which is the drainage of the kidney. And if the half-time is elevated, we say it's obstructed, but it really, it really may not be. And a lot of pediatric urologists will not rely on just the drainage time. We have to look at other factors. But then we look at differential renal function. Differential renal function could mean that that's what you got when you're born, or it could mean that you have something that you need to be concerned about because you might have ongoing loss of renal function, uh, or you wanna do something to keep the little function you have from getting worse. And so what is the critical value? Most of us accept that if the patient looks obstructed, their drainage is impaired, and their function is less than 35 to 40, uh, percent compared to the contralateral side, or they get worse over subsequent studies by greater than 5%, that would be an indication for fixing obstruction. We know from our uh, results of surgery that pyeloplasty is about 95% successful, but 37% of those patients on these renal scans will still show obstructive patterns. And so we look at obstruction, we say, well, now it's less obstructive because maybe their drainage is less impaired. Um, and then, um, a lot of these uh, functional, uh, functional studies, when you repeat them, may give you different answers. And uh, so we, we have to put it all together. So what are the limitations of our gold standards? Well, we have renal sonography, as I said to, uh, at the outset, that this is easy and cheap uh, to do. It gives you uh, good anatomy, not great anatomy, it gives you good anatomy gives you nothing about function, although some studies have shown that you can correlate some of these great uh, images with functional studies, and maybe you don't always need to do functional studies. And we typically re will reserve renal functional studies for the ones with more moderate to severe levels of hydronephrosis. The functional studies we have are MAG3 scans, DTPA scans, uh, and MR urography. With the um, MAG3s and DTPAs, the reported false negative false positive rate is referred to be about 15%. Um, so we tend to repeat these studies and get trends. And is that really the right thing to do? Well, hopefully MR urography will answer that as well. So MR urography, everybody knows what an MRI is. Uh, this is the combination of uh, MRI with uh, renal scintigraphy. 
Um, and uh, the problem is that even though it's ideal, it could be quite expensive. Um, and uh, and um, it's not available everywhere in the country. So when I'm seeing a, a family, I'll say, we have two tests. This one uh, is the gold standard throughout the world, referring to the MAG3 scan, and say, but we are very fortunate to have the MRI urography. And the benefit there is that we may not have to repeat it as many times. They will get a better answer from the beginning. And I think a lot of people that understand this, some of the families that come see me for these problems, they usually say, well, let's do the MRI. It just seems like it, it's a better test. And it is a better test. So we uh, uh, jokingly call nuclear medicine unclear medicine uh, because you're seeing a lot of black dots or white dots. And then you have to, you have to put an uh, area of interest around this and uh, figure out what the differential renal function is. And then you have to look at these drainage curves. Um, and so um, that's why it's, it's unclear. And, that, and there's, there's error with it. We, we have renal scans where the technician would draw an area of interest around what they thought was the kidney, and the kidney was in the pelvis. But they still had 18% function of what they drew. So there's a lot of error involved in it. And a lot of it has to do with, with technicians. Um, so the DMSA scan is a study that will you know, look at um, whether there is renal scarring. Um, it maybe helps to determine if there's dysplasia. But again, you're dealing with black dots. You're dealing with the machine that will measure the activity in the areas of interest. Um, and, um, uh, and so we call this the isoposotope scan, because you really don't know. Now, I joke about that, but the DMSA scan is actually a very good way of determining differential renal function. But remember, you're not, you're not determining the function of the kidney. You're determining where the function is in that patient's body, right? So if you have a differential function of 50-50, one kidney contributes half the function, the other one uh, contributes the other half. If you cut those kidneys both in half, your scan will show 50-50, and again, it'll show 50-50. So remember that, that it's not telling you the function, it's telling you where the function's located. So we do creatinines with these patients and figure out what their actual function is. So here's an example of um, a DMSA. Um, this is um, in a, uh, this is a, a scan, a DMSA in a five-year-old girl with reflux. Um, and this is red, if you look at these images, it's red as that there is a moderate degree uh, of scarring on the left and a mild degree of scarring on the right. Um, and the differential function will be 66% on the left. And these are, these are images behind the patient. So this, this is the left kidney. Um, and then the right kidney is gonna have 34% function. Now, if you take that same patient uh, and you do uh, an MRI, you could see here that this kidney is really deformed. Uh, this will be a lot of renal dysplasia, reflux nephropathy, and what was considered to be mild is actually severe bilaterally. Okay, so it, it, it doesn't really give you enough detail. And here's just another example of how you could look at those kidneys. So all the areas that have uh, black patches in them are either a dilated collecting system or an area that's just uh, of parenchyma that is so damaged that it doesn't take up any of the gadolinium contrast. So that's one example of how you may get better information. Um, and so what we want to do is take a scan like this and then morph it into something that will give us way more detail. So as you look at this image, you can see the collecting system, you can see the renal parenchyma, you can see where there's a couple of upper pole scar. You could subtract the parenchyma, just look at the collecting system. You could spin it, you could show the parents this in the office, and they could say, yeah, the, my child has renal scarring in the upper pole, you know, and, and really get way better information than the other ones. So MRI urography is, is very similar, as I said before, to renal scintigraphy. The contrast agent is gadolinium, and it's bound to DTPA. Um, and it allows, uh, because it gets taken up and excreted in the kidney, it allows you to follow it through all compartments of the kidney. And I'll go over that in a second. So you could get all the anatomy that you could see with an MRI that everybody's familiar with, um, and also get all the functional information in one study. And there's no radiation, so this is also an added benefit. Uh, we do these under sedation um, at our uh, institution. Um, one of the drawbacks initially of doing this was that everybody 
thought I'd just assume that we were doing this under general anesthesia, but it's uh, we have a, a dedicated sedation team uh, that comes in for all these cases. So a little bit about gadolinium. Um, this is a paramagnetic contrast agent. It is freely filtered by the glomerulus. It's not secreted, it's not absorbed, and therefore the signal intensity um, is altered by the GFR. So you won't see it as much in the kidney if you have poor flow to your kidney or low GFR. This just kind of shows you where DTPA works as opposed to DMSA uh, or MAG3. So here's a normal uh, MR urogram. And you can see the kidney's uptake is pretty equal. The, um, that, and that shows you the early cortical phase. Um, and then you get into the medullary phase. So now um, you could divide them and look at the renal medulla. Um, and then finally, you could get to um, the excretory phase. Um, so you could, you could look at transport of gadolinium through each part of the kidney. Um, and it allows you to determine um, if there is obstruction and, and what degree of obstruction is. So if you have really have a very obstructed kidney, you would think that the flow to that kidney would be very low, which is true. Uh, but some of these kidneys look awful, but they have very good flow. And I'll show you some examples of that. So then after you get your, your um, cortical, medullary, and excretory phases, you could then do these three-dimensional reconstructions that I just showed you. Then there is a phase where it's called the concatenated MIP. And what that is, is a maximum injection profile or maximum in intensity profile. Um, and that is kind of like doing, uh, the older people in the crowd will remember the intravenous pilogram. Um, and that is basically what you're getting here. So we're gonna get it through this phase, but it's really more three-dimensional. The next thing you get is relative signal intensity. So you could look at various parts of the kidney as I showed you before. You're gonna first see it go into the aorta. It will then go into the renal artery. It will then go into the kidney. So you'll see a cortical phase, which would be first, medullary phase, which would be second. And then in yellow here is, is the uh, collecting system. And then you could compare um, the relative a signal in the right kidney versus the left kidney compared to your aorta. Okay, so this relationship right here is very important. This is blood flow, gadolinium measured in the aorta, and this is then the um, subsequent excretion uptake uh, drainage from each of the kidneys. So this is what a normal one would look like. So you can't really talk about MR urography without talking about nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. This is a great boards question. Um, and uh, I'll say that this is very rare. We have not seen it at our institution over the last 15 years. It happens more in adults, I believe. Um, but there is a warning about gadolinium. Um, this is linked to gadolinium exposure. And um, it is the, the common link with this dermatologic disorder is that uh, it happens in patients with renal failure. So a question might be that gadolinium causes renal failure, and that's not true it actually causes a dermatologic disorder in people with renal failure. And so if they need to have an MRU and they have renal failure, dialysis is what you do right after it. As I said, it is very rare, which always makes it a good boards question. Oh, here's a boards question right here. Okay, so gadolinium exposure is a risk factor for acute renal failure in children with normal kidney function, and that would not be a true statement. So what are the indications? As I said before, it's, it's expensive, um, and how can we use this most effectively? So what I do is I really reserve MR urography for grade four hydronephrosis, ones that I think need an operation. Uh, grade threes that maybe were equivocal studies on mag three spans, and I want a good second opinion. I think MR urography is great. Um, so unusual anatomy on an ultrasound, you're not really clear. Maybe there's a pelvic kidney, a duplex system, crossed fused kidney, something uh, unusual would be a great case for an MRI. Um, if there's bilateral renal involvement, you can look at each kidney separately and not necessarily get differential renal function, but actually measure the kidney. And I'll, I'll show you that as well. Um, and then, as I said, anticipated surgical cases. And the reason I say this is because a lot of us before doing a pyeloplasty, We'll, um, we'll do a retrograde uh, ureterogram to really 
show where our level of obstruction is, although it's where we think it is probably 99.99% of the time, we always do it. Um, and it's, it's uh, institutions do, it, do these things differently. But um, with the MRU, you could actually see the ureter in its entire course probably 98% of the time, so you don't need to add that additional procedure at the time of surgery. Um, and again, inconclusive studies would be a reason to do uh, MR urography. So um, as you know from just plain MRI, there's a, a conventional T2 weighted image that shows you the water content. You remember that by H2O. And this would be an example. So here is a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. If you did a DMSA scan on this patient, you'd see nothing there because there would be no function. But on uh, the T2 weighted image of an MRI, you're going to see the, anything fluid show up as, as white. Um, and you can also see the water content within a very normal kidney over here um, uh, in the medullary interstitial area. Um, and then, of course, you get the functional uh, information. So here's a girl. Um, I'm not sure if Angie, you were a fellow with this case. I think you may have been. But this was a girl that was uh, nine. She came with continuous incontinence. Um, and uh, she had a uh, right kidney that was enlarged to 12.6 centimeters, normal location, non-dilated collecting system. That was a solitary kidney, and she had a normal bladder. And it should be knee-jerk that this is a patient um, that is nine that's continuously wet. They have an ectopic ureter. Okay, so that would explain why they're continuously wet. Um, so when we do the MRI, you can see the solitary kidney here. You don't see any kidney on the other side there's a small amount of tissue that's showing up over here. Um, and then if you look at the T2 weighted images, you can see some, some uh, dilation of a distal ureter here. Um, and then you also see another ureter over here. So it's a little bit confusing. It wasn't clear uh, exactly what all this was in this particular patient. And so we brought it to surgeries. We saw the, the single right ureteral orifice and no left orifice. Did vaginoscopy, that seemed normal. Did a vaginogram to make sure that there wasn't an ectopic ureter to the vagina that would reflux, didn't see it there. Um, and the only way that we could prove that we, we did uh, um, try to find that tissue that we saw in the MRI, it looked like a very small lymph node. We did not see the ureter at all and sent it for a frozen section um, and it came back as kidney. This was the second case that I've had like this that I clearly would not know that would be the kidney unless I had at least some indication here um, from the study. And probably the, you know, the second time in my career that I had to do a frozen section to prove that I did a nephrectomy. Yeah, you usually don't have to do that. But her incontinence was cured from that. So as I said earlier, UPJ obstruction, that is the most common cause uh, um, uh, problem that we see in kids with moderate to severe hydronephrosis. And this is, this is your classic uh, bear claw. Uh, we just need the palm and all the fingers. Uh, configuration, this would be somebody that probably come to us with bilateral hydronephrosis, left grade four, maybe right would be maybe grade two, um, and uh, would undergo uh, the study. And the reconstructed images are amazing because, you know, if you, you could show families, you know, what you need to remove in this case, and put the two ends back together, it makes it very crystal clear uh, what you're doing. And this is just, again, this is the the type of anatomy you get um, where you uh, really don't need to do retrograde urography. You have all your information in one scan. We've learned that, uh, and you don't need MR urography to know this as a pediatric urologist, but there's a lot of variation in UPJ obstructions and where the UPJ is actually located. Some of these could be so big that on retrograde, your left obstructed UPJ could be lateral on the right side of the normal kidney. And that's, you know, those are just tremendously difficult cases to deal with, but you can see that they could be classic, they could be uh, a low-lying one, um, or they could just be so big with a nephritic ureter that, you know, considerations would, for this kind of case, would be to do a flap of the pelvis down to the bladder, especially if that was a solitary kidney, but you really need to know what the function is and the drainage and whether it's obstructed. Duplication anomalies. Um, you could think of the MAG-3 studies, which is kind of standard, and the ultrasound is the complementary studies that you need to do to get the information that you might see in a case like this. So this is kind of the classic upper pole ureter, lower pole, um, and they, 
across and then go into the latter in a typical uh, Meyer Weidrich fashion. So here's a child with antenatal hydronephrosis. So if we follow this study, we could see that the left side is duplicated. The right side is duplicated. There's really not a whole lot of hydronephrosis going on in either of these liberals. And uh, when you do, so this would be the T1 weighted image because it's showing you uh, all the contrast would, would, be, would be white. You'd be able to see that pretty easily. Uh, but if you do the T2 weighted image, you get this picture. Yeah, there's no way you're going to know that's what that kitty looked like based based on this. And this is very primitive. Remember, I, I showed you those nice pictures earlier about primitive systems, and they branch just with like two branches. That's kind of what's going on in the upper poles of this this kidney. So this one is duplicated, obstructed, mid ureteric structure, distal ureteric structure, um, and the approach to all these different problems um, are, are are different approaches surgically. Here's some other unusual duplications, I'd say, for the residents. Whenever you see two dilated ureters on the same side, it usually means that the pathology involves both of them. Um, and so you should think about why configured ureters. Um, this would be an example of a normal right side and a duplicated system that will come down and, and have a obstruction right outside of the bladder that involves both moieties of a partially duplicated system. And this one is a bilaterally duplicated system. But this side is, is completely normal. Let's see if I can drag on that one. Yeah, so, sorry. Okay, so this side um, is, is normal on the right. Very normal looking ureters going down. And look at the relationship um, on, the, on the left kidney between that big dilated ureter, which is ectopic, and somewhere below the bladder, and the smaller ureter that you see next to it. And you know this is why you, you need to be careful doing these cases. If you're doing a nephroureterectomy, that ureter is really tangled up within the big dilated ureter. Um, and you can see that, that relationship clearly, and if you do this laparoscopically, you can see it clearly there as well. Mid-ureteric strictures is a diagnosis that you can't make preoperatively without hemoureography. So this would require um, that you do retrograde urography to make this diagnosis. Um, you don't necessarily want to do dorsal lumbotomy pyeloplasties in somebody who has mid ureteric strictures. So that would be, you know, that would be a no-no. So uh, you need to know where the obstruction is. And this is why retrogrades are helpful if you don't have uh, the uh, MRU. So some malformations are interesting. Let's see if anybody could guess the diagnosis on this one. We'll start off on this side of the room, and then if you need help, you can ask people this way. So what do you think the diagnosis is here? Where do you see the renal parenchyma? Is it normal? Okay, so you, it looks like you have kidneys that are maybe kind of coming together. They're all attached. They're hooves. Yes, horseshoe kidney. All right, so, so that would be your functional. So you could look at this and say, yeah, this is a horseshoe kidney. This side is probably normal. The left moiety is normal. It looks like it drains. The bladder is already full of contrast. It's probably coming from that side. The right side is very patchy. The, the function is going to be poorer on that side. And then that's, that's the image you get from the T2. So this is, this is all of this area that doesn't have any uptake because it's obstructed. And uh, you know, an ultrasound would show you that you have dilation there, but these images are pretty incredible. And again, the just primitive branching of these kidneys I mean it's re it's related to early obstruction and, and dysplasia. Uh, and here's an example of a, chi uh, a child that we had recently that had um, a mid ureteric structure right there, that's actually real. That's, you can also see that, that type of configuration with normal peristalsis. But in this case, that was actually a real obstruction uh, and also obstructed down here. So the, if you look at these images, um, you can see there's a, a segment here that's not seen and there's a dilated uh, segment on either side and it's dilated distal to it. So this one underwent a robotic ureteral ureterostomy up here, a tapered mega ureter repair down there and um, did very well. Uh, Megakalicosis is another diagnosis where MR urography has been fairly useful. 
Um, mega calicosis means that you have way too many calices. I think it's like 15 to 18 above, something like that, where you have too many calices. This, if you look at the definition of, of mega calicosis, it's defined as a non-obstructive form of hydronephrosis. With our MRIs, we have already identified about five or six cases of crossing vessels and clear obstruction. Um, so, um, so I think just having a sharper tool helps redefine some of these problems. And um, you know, as I said yesterday, we have a very large coon belly population. Um, so we have a bunch of kids that underwent MR urography um, and we have found things that we kind of knew would be there like renal dysplasia in 40% of patients, uh, underlying scarring. And we could tell um, the difference between scarring and dysplasia with MR urography um, with many different signs. And so we could distinguish them. And then the thing that was never described before are calocele diverticuli. So we we're able to identify uh, dilated urinary tract in areas where we actually were able to measure it previously. Um, this is a child that came to me with about four years of intermittent back pain and hematuria. Um, every time we got a renal scan on the patient, when they weren't having pain, it went right through. And that's very typical of the patients that we see uh, with intermittent UPJ obstruction. Uh, but when they're, um, but you always have to consider some of these unusual cases as having a fibroepithelial polyp. They're rare, but look how beautifully you could you could see this um, on an MRU. Now, if you do a retrograde on these, you might you might see something that suggests something like this. But if you have a polyp that starts off at the UPJ above the UPJ in the renal pelvis, it could flop down and go down the ureter. You do a retrograde, you shoot it back into the kidney, and you may not see it at all. And so you have to have a high suspicion. Most uh, traditionally, most fibroepithelial polyps were diagnosed at the time of surgery um, in cases that were difficult. And so that's a, a good uh, anatomic view of a fibroepithelial polyp. Okay, so uh, let's talk again about hydronephrosis and renal dysgenesis. Um, so we're trying to distinguish uh, renal dysplasia on MRU um, from acquired renal scarring. So Think about a girl with recurrent reflux uh, with repeated infections over several several years is going to have a renal scan that's going to show a potentially a severely scarred kidney. That's acquired renal scarring. Presumably that kidney was normal first and they have acquired scars. How do you distinguish that from the boy usually that has grade five reflux that has poor kidney function who's never had a UTI? That's not acquired scarring now. We call that renal dysplasia. And so with these studies, we could figure that out. And again, this is that primitive kidney, and I'll show you some more pictures of that. So we were able to look at a group of 67 patients, and what we found on, on the MRU was loss of corticomedullary differentiation, renal cystic changes, solid dysplasia, hypoplasia, hypodysplasia, the dysmorphic calyces, and what we call the lobster claw deformity. And the lobster claw deformity is this. So again, when you're looking at this picture, and um, it basically ends there. You'll see that um, you know, it branches into two and maybe a couple more branches and that's it. So if you see that, that is a sign of renal dysplasia. There it is. And that's why it's called the lobster claw deformity. So this is a kid that has primitive calyces, renal dysplasia and hypodysplasia of the other side. Look at this, this ureter. Those are called fetal folds. And, and so we could easily see this. Again, you wouldn't know about fetal folds unless you did a retrograde. Uh, their importance are maybe a little, they're a little less important because most of them do go away, but I have seen in my practice fetal folds turn into obstruction. So I, I'm still concerned about something like that. And here's an example of reflux nephropathy. You can see a very small kidney on one side with the primitive calyces, scarring on the other side. And then looking at just the collecting system, and you, you know you, the, the scarring that happens with reflux nephropathy is polar, so it should be in the upper pole, and lower pole mostly, um, and um, and that you could you could clearly see on these. So uh, here's an example of a multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. So which side would the multi-cystic dysplastic kidney be? Would it be here or over here? I'll answer it. It would be over here because it has no function, so you don't see it. Right? That's a DMSA. This is a hypodysplastic kidney. You can't tell on a DMSA it's hypodysplastic um, until you, you know, do an MRU, and that's kind of what your anatomy is. 
So again, this is your multi-assistic dysplastic kidney, but again, two branches, primitive calyces. It's not dysplastic, it functions, but it's, it's poorly developed, so we call it hypodysplastic. Okay, so here's UPJ and dysplasia. Um, so here's the kidney, it's picking up the gadolinium, patchy pattern here, and then it stops. This is, again, this is one that is very primitive. This actually, this patient started off in, in uh, Nigeria, went to New York, um, had one of Aziz's partners do uh, a pyeloplasty on it, uh, on this child. Um, it failed twice. Um, it, um, she ended up having a nephrostomy tube in her kidney. She came down, they moved to Atlanta, um, and um, I did this study on her, and um, she, I've been following her now for about 14 years, and this is what her kidney looks like. So right now, this girl, the only operation I could think to, to do with this very complicated case was to do a Bowari clap up to the kidney, and I did that, and it did great for about eight years. Um, then she developed reflux into that kidney. Then she moved back to Nigeria, was followed in Great Ormond Street, and by the nephrologist there. And she basically stores urine in her renal pelvis to the point where her whole abdomen is full of, of, of um, uh, renal pelvis. Perfectly happy kid, had a stable creatinine, urodynamics were normal, but she basically had two bladders. And so she, this case was presented at every visiting professor we ever had, and the answer was always, I tried to do nothing. And so for nothing is what we did. Um, and she, um, right now, um, is on a transplant list, which will, uh, I'll probably just take her kidney out at the time of the transplant. But very interesting that if you have a low pressure system, you could go a very long period of time with, with poor underlying kidney function until you hit puberty. And that's where, where you have problems. Okay. So this is uh, you know, what reflux, nephropathy, and dysplasia looks like, and just anatomically. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the functional evaluation because the functional evaluation is, is really the most interesting part of this and the, I think the most, most difficult. And so what we're doing with differential renal function is determining the volume of enhancing renal parenchyma and it's very similar to what you get from a GMSA scan. We have something called the PATLAC number which is an index of the GFR um, which is similar to a DTPA renal scan, and then something called the asymmetry index. And the asymmetry index I'll go into in a second, but what we're doing there is we're taking a volume of kidney tissue from one side and comparing it to a volume of kidney tissue on the other side. Because there are small volumes, it really doesn't matter how big the kidneys are, you can look at a very small kidney and compare it to a very big kidney and know that their function may be the same or impaired. Um, so we're going to go look at signal intensity curves as a measure of function, and then we're going to look at compartmental renal transit times to see the flow through the kidney. And so this is volumetric. So here's an example of somebody whose kidneys, uh, the uptake is, is the same on both sides, um, and you could look at them and say they're about 50-50. And here's an example of somebody who's got more kidney tissue on the right than the left, and so you could say that about 20% of the kidney function is on that side, and that's based on volume. When you get a MAG3 renal scan, this is the information you're getting. You're getting volumetric assessment of function. It doesn't tell you the function of the tissue in that volume. It tells you what the function is within the entire volume. So you're going to get dysplastic tissue, you're going to get non-functioning tissue, and you're going to get functioning tissue, and that will give you your opinion. Okay, and this is all uh, based on this, this um, chain of compartments that I talked about earlier. Gadolinium goes into the aorta, goes into the renal artery, goes into the kidney, all the compartments of the kidney, and then washes out. Um, so we, the PATLAC is basically based on a two compartment model. And it basically is the, um, it's looking at the vascular system, it's looking at the nephron, and it's ignoring everything in between. So there's no background false positivity or negativity, and the slope of this change from the aorta to the collect to the uh, renal parenchyma is what determines the GFR. 
So here's an example. It looks complicated, but that's the, I think the formula for a straight line. Um, and so y equals mx plus b. And if you measure the signal uptake here and you determine this graph, that slope, which is represented by these numbers over here, 14 and 10, will give you your differential function of 60 and 40. Okay, so you're actually seeing where the gadolinium is. It has to be functioning tissue. And if you plot the GFR based on measurement by creatinine clearance by two different formulas, there's one that's weight-based, so there's one that's height-based. This height-based Schwartz formula is probably the more common one that's used. But if you, if you log these or measure these, you can see that the MRU GFR has a direct relationship with the other measured creatinine clearances. And so uh, this is a very good way of measuring creatinine clearance. So two ways of looking at function, volumetric and PATLAC. So think of PATLAC as GFR. Volumetric is an estimate of the mass of tissue. It's not a measure of the quality of tissue. PATLAC is an index of individual kidney GFR. It reflects both volume and function of the tissue. And it's most, it's most useful, especially for research, to have a contralateral kidney with which to compare it to. And if you, in a, in a normal situation, what you're measuring by volume and what you measure by GFR really should be the same thing, okay? Uh, it's when you start to have impairment that you have problems. So this would be measuring uh, a PATLAC differential renal function versus a, a volumetric, and if you can see it's a straight line. Now, this, this is very interesting. This is what I was telling you before. The unit PATLAC is really, it's taking care of those problems where you have one kidney that's small and one kidney that's big because you can compare uh, a cc of tissue on this side to a cc of tissue on this side and say, yes, this kidney has one third of the differential function, but the kidney function within that volume is the same as the other side. And I'll show you some examples of that. So now you can measure GFR in a single nephron. Very interesting. We call this nephron density. And the mean um, of a normal tissue would be 0.38. Okay, so 0.38 would be 38 milliliters per minute drainage through that kidney. Now, when is it decreased? It's decreased if you're obstructed. Okay, it's decreased if you have a uropathic kidney. And it, it is decreased if you have renal artery stenosis, you're not getting the blood flow. And it's increased if you have hyperfiltration. That kidney is a super functioning kidney. And so that unit PATLAC would show a higher number. Now, the asymmetry index is a way of quantifying what you measure by volume and what you me measure by GFR, because the bigger difference there is, remember that curve that showed it was a straight line, but in the obstructed and poorly functioning kidneys, um, it's not gonna be a straight line. Difference between those two numbers is what we call the asymmetry index. So the difference between the left and the right over the total would be an asymmetry index. And if that difference is greater than 15%, then we consider that to be significant. So here again is a kid with antenatal hydronephrosis. This would be the normal kidney. And if you watch this kidney drain, you can see the collecting system. This side, the collecting system showed up almost the same time as the other side filled up the renal pelvis, and then it drained. So the question is, is that obstructed? And if you look at the um, signal intensity curves, you can see these lines overlap. So this is a hydronephrotic kidney that's not obstructed. So remember, hydronephrosis doesn't equal uh, obstruction, and that does not equal renal damage. Okay? This, this happens in normal kidneys. And you can see that the unit patlax, 0.38 was the number I told you was normal. These are both above that. The asymmetry index is, is 4%, so that's a, a normal kidney. So this is something we'd probably just follow with ultrasound and see which way things go. Um, here's a child with prior hemianephrectomy. So normal right kidney, lower pulse should also be normal. Um, and when you do the anatomy, you, you see you know, what you'd expect to see. Um, and in here, the kidney function on this side is 34%. Um, and uh, on this side, it's 66% you've taken off a third of that kidney. But if you look at the signal intensity curves, you'd expect it to be normal. Um, and if you look at the asymmetry index, that lower pole has just as good function as the other side. And so it's smaller, but normal. 
Okay, so here's the kid with hydronephrosis. Right side is starting to show up and drain. Left side is big. You see kind of pat patchy uptake. And during this study, you start to see a drain. And then by the end of the 45 minutes, or whatever they're going to give this kid to drain, um, you don't see anything. So is that kidney obstructed? And that's the anatomy you see. Asymmetry, the um, differential renal function by volume would be 67% um, on the right kidney. That's this one. This one had a third function, right? 33%. And so that's by volume. If you do the signal intensity curves, you have uh, on the obstructed side on the left, you can see that this is a flat curve that doesn't go down. Okay, so it just keeps on accumulating, just like the, what you saw here, it just keeps on accumulating. Um, and then if you look at the uh, PATLAC, um, unit PATLAC, um, the left side is impaired, it's below 0.38. And now the asymmetry index is almost 40%. So this is a kidney that not only is obstructed, but if you fix it, because the asymmetry index is high, you can actually improve its function. Now, some of these, the asymmetry index is, is normal, but it's obstructed. And in those cases, yes, you can improve the drainage, but there's really no wiggle room to improve the function. This is the first time you can, you can really know this information, which I think is very exciting. Um, so it helps with counseling, whether or not you can improve function or just improve drainage. Now we have this, this situation I just showed you, two kidneys that have about 34% function. One side is normal, the other one's impaired, and we were able to figure that out easily based on these, the drainage, the asymmetry index uh, of both sides and determine which one is the problem. So just to review that, then we have what we call the nephrogram. The nephrogram is gonna be a perfusion phase, a concentration phase, and an excretion phase. And you get all of that from the signal intensity curves. And um, uh, again, this is excluding the collecting system. And one of the big problems we have with MAG3s is that if you have a hyperfiltrating kidney, when they look at the function between both sides, and it's going into a big dilated system. They can't tell the difference between the collecting system, where the activity is, and the renal parenchyma. So you'll overestimate kidney function a lot of the time in the kidneys that have uh, very large collecting systems. So here's another example of a kid that has two kidneys, um, and you can see that this side looks like it's about to excrete normally. This side is a long kidney, a little delayed uh, excretion, and that's an obstructed pattern, right? That's, that's going up and not coming down. Uh, so the right side here is obstructed. By volume, now if you did a MAG3 renal scan on this patient, it would tell you that your kidney function uh, on the right side is 53%. So, oh, that kidney is big, it has better function. You know, this is not an indication of surgery, let's just watch this. If you do it by PATLAC in the same patient on the same day, now the right side is 45%. The asymmetry index is 37%. So that's one, if you fix it, you, you might even get super normal function. You might go from 45 to 55 after fixing it. It's not because the other side got worse, it's because the bad side got better. Here's a, a, a kid that has what appears to be a normal kidney showing up pretty quickly on that side, and then some patchy kidney over here with poor uptake and poor excretion. But look at the drainage curves. There's a little bit of delayed uh, uptake and, dra and drainage, but the pattern is not obstructed. If you look at the left side, the function is 25% by volume. It's 23% by GFR, the asymmetry index normal. So even though this kidney has hydronephrosis, it's not obstructed. Okay? In those cases, we call that a uropathic kidney. There's really nothing you can do for that kidney except for watch it and hope they don't get hypertension. Okay, here's another example. So look at this kidney. Um, I have to point this one out. Which kidney takes up the contrast first, the left or the right? The left is, right? It's excreting way before the other side. And you can see that there's really no obstruction to this kidney. The PATLAC and the volumetric are the same. The asymmetry index is the same. 
this is rapid excretion. This is a kidney that I previously operated on for a bit of pyeloplasty on who has a concentrating defect in their kidney. They just pour, pour urine out, so they actually function more than the other side. I just said, I thought I just did a good operation, but it really is it's that the kidney is bad kidney, um, and that's one that we'll worry about. So we talked about the different models. Uh, this is just to show that now we can measure transit through whole parts of the kidney through the nephron. Very interesting because before this, we only knew what the half time was, and it was very flawed. So renal transit time is a number that's very similar to the half time that we were used to measuring. And we've done this on a lot of patients to know that if the transit time through the kidney, the renal transit time is the time the gadolinium hits the kidney, and below, goes below the lower pole of the kidney. So it's really looking for UPJ obstruction. If it's greater than eight minutes, then it's obstructed. So we were able to look at uh, a lot of normal kidneys as well as kidneys with UPJ obstruction. And we looked at something called the, the mean transit time um, as opposed to the renal transit time. It's just another way of measuring transit and it's prolonged if you're obstructed and it's prolonged if you have renal artery stenosis, and it's faster, just like the other measurements of renal vehicular filtration. When we do renal scans, we give a Lasix challenge. And the reason we give a Lasix challenge is so we could maybe unmask some levels of obstruction and get the information earlier. There are some protocols where you actually give the Lasix 15 minutes before the study. That's called an F-15 protocol for pyrosamide. Um, and then there's, uh, most of the protocols will give the, um, nuclear agent and then give uh, Lasix about 15 minutes after and see what happens. Does Lasix make it drain better or does it look like it's still accumulating? So this is an example of compensated hydronephrosis. So you have hydronephrosis, you give diuretic and it washes through. With a high flow rate, it doesn't look like it's a static system. So in that case, it's, an, it's not obstructed. And in this case, if you have accumulation before you give your Lasix and there's truly an obstruction here, you're gonna to start to see that with high flow rates, um, you have hydronephrosis that's decompensated. Okay, so this is the one we're worried about, not that one. Okay, so here's an example of a compensated UPJ obstruction. Okay, so the right kidney is normal, the left kidney is gonna drain, and this is the same case I showed earlier uh, on. Um, and it's going through, right? We knew this was not obstructed. So there is a UPJ narrowing, but that kidney is compensated. The curves are overlapping. The function by volume and GFR are the same, and the asymmetry mix is normal. That one we don't have to worry about. Decompensated UPJ obstruction are the ones that we do operate on. And these are the ones that um, look like this. So normal right kidney and the left kidney is taking a longer time to drain. And uh, this is the curve I showed you before. When you look at the asymmetry index, by, by volume it's 50, by PATLAC it's 38. So that's when you know that not only obstructed, I could improve their function by unobstructing them. And then again, the uropathic kidney is, again looks like this, and these are, these are the ones that you can't really do much about. So not all UPJs or hydronephrosis cases are the same, and I gave you three examples of kidneys that had 33% function, but we're all very different. Some you can't do anything about, some you could do something about and not improve their function, and others you could both improve their function and improve their drainage. So how do we redefine UPJ obstruction? So now we can redefine UPJ obstruction based on functional and anatomic classifications. We have our nephrogram, we can look at the architecture of the renal parenchyma. We can look at patterns of signal intensity versus time. We have an asymmetry index, we have mean transit time, we have a new classification where we can define it as compensated or decompensated. Um, and this is always gonna be confounded by various issues, varying degrees of your uropathy or dysplasia. And then if you have bilateral disease, some of these are harder to do because we don't have a contralateral control. Um, here's an example of using the asymmetry index to measure your success after pyeloplasty. So all the successful ones had an elevated asymmetry index that dropped. Now, some of these may drop and still be defined as obstructed just based on that number I gave you earlier, 0.38. But um, you could also see the ones that didn't do well, their, their asymmetry index got worse. Okay, so you could, you could look at this and, path, and look at the pathophysiology of the kidney using MRIography to know if, if this is really a success after surgery or not. 
Um, so what are the implications? If you have a compensated UPJ obstruction, they rarely will get worse over time. And there's little change in the function following your pyeloplasty. If they're decompensated, then you'll, you expect them to have better um, function after you fix them. And then the asymmetry index is really the best way of figuring this out. This is um, the way I was taught to do pyeloplasties in infants. Um, Sarah probably was taught the same way. <laughs> so, uh, and Angie was taught the same way. Um, and um, this is a dorsal lobotomy. This is why I don't do robotics in babies, because a dorsal lobotomy is basically almost like one large port in the back that they never see. And we're doing our Amazon Turk um, uh, scar preference study. I showed you the results of lower abdominal incision, 80% of people that were surveyed chose a dorsal lobotomy when you give them a choice between a dorsal lobotomy or flank or even laparoscopic ports. And this is great because you could pull the renal pelvis out of the body and do an extracorporeal pyeloplasty and then drop it in. And they have tiny scars that they don't see. So for me, this is the way to go. And, and um, I, I don't encourage robotics in babies. Um, so here's a case of a decompensated UPJ obstruction. Again, the curves are not equal. So this side looks like it's doing what we call the squirrel sign. And that's something you do see with the obstructed kidneys. And volume is um, on the left side is 51%, but by PATLAC, it's 41%. So again, I just want to drive home this point that MAG3 scans um, will overestimate that kidney function because this is what you get with a GFR evaluation. It's 10% lower. And um, the asymmetry index, again, is elevated. And here's a successful pyeloplasty. So now if you look at this kidney, again, that drains quickly. I showed you this case before. It goes right through. Um, and you know that's successful. Improved the drainage curves. And now you have equal function by both parameters. So the GFR increased 10 points on that case, and the asymmetry index is now normal. Here's a case of compensated hydronephrosis. And in this case, you had about equal volumetric and PATLAC, and therefore your asymmetry index was, was not elevated. So if you do a successful pyeloplasty, in that case, uh, nothing really changes except for drainage. So you have good, good drainage through the UP. This is a case of a delayed dense nephrogram. This is more of a dysplastic kidney, and that kidney will continue to accumulate. And after surgery, uh, you can see that this side will now drain much better with a nice dilated ureter through the UPJ. So pre-op curve, post-op curves are going down. That's what you want to see. So how do you define alloplasty outcomes? Well, we could define it as successful if they have stable, improved hydronephrosis, rapid calus no transit, normalization of asymmetry index, failed pyeloplasties would be the opposite, increased hydronephrosis, delayed transit time, persistent or, or deranged asymmetry index. And I showed you my successes. Now I'll show you my partner's failures. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this came from an outside hospital. I always call uh, my failures, they came from an outside hospital. We have two children's hospitals, so I could just say it came from the one across town where I also operate. Uh, but this is, came from an outside hospital. And you can see here that the, uh, the, the left kidney that's obstructed was 56%, I'm sorry, 44% asymmetry index was elevated. And then, as we learned in CHOP, some lube operated on this patient and made them worse. And so that's what that was really done in saying is now this kidney's not draining very well. And so the asymmetry index got worse. Okay, so this served as a way of saying, yeah, all this information is useful. And that's what they had after. You know, so this could happen because you don't recognize that your obstruction is not only in one place. Um, I don't know what happened in this case, or whose patient that was, but, but the, um, that is, to me looks like there's fetal folds that maybe got on. And uh, you know, here's an example of an equivocal one where the um, asymmetry index was, was elevated. And then afterwards, um, it's elevated, but better. Okay, so it did improve, but it still doesn't look so great. 
that's kind of the anatomy here. So, you know, this is a case where uh, this patient needs a revision because that still looks pretty bad. So in terms of post polyplasty outcomes, there's definitely a spectrum from excellent to failed. It's not binary. The natural history has not been established. Um, how many uh, equivocal polyplasties improve or deteriorate, we have no idea. Uh, we think MR urography is much more nuanced assessment, uh, anatomy, function, um, and everything that I just told you. So now we're going to focus um, uh, using MR urography uh, to the renal parenchyma. You know, we're really looking at where the action is. And uh, there's nothing that really, as a single unit identifies what what we should be looking at. But when you put all this together, we have a lot of pathophysiology now where we could redefine the significance of obstruction. So it has a great prognostic value. I, he talks about compensated obstruction, decompensated obstruction, and how asymmetry indexes the, the simple way to go. We could evaluate anatomy and physiology simultaneously. And as I showed you in these pictures, there is nothing better than an MRI uh, to look at the anatomy of the urinary tract. We have quantitative measurements. We have a single test without ionizing radiation. We could, we could classify and grade the degree of obstruction. We could dis distinguish scarring from congenital dysplasia. Um, and we think, and I can tell you this little conclusion line here, is something I've been saying for 15 years. And that's just true of technology, um, that it takes years and years and years. You guys do MR urography here, right? Yeah. So, you know, probably 10 years ago you weren't, maybe? Uh, you know, so. It's, um, it's still considered to be a relatively new, new tool. So thank you very much for your time. Now, the uh, net model is what has been used most throughout. You know, Germany and Japan do a lot of this stuff also, and that's the model that they have been using. But yeah, I mean, there's a, if you're looking and you're, this is your area of interest with the kidney function, uh, as you do, I mean, there's ways of defining these problems that you know, could easily go by, beyond what we're doing, you know, and, and really define these things. It, it, I, you know, the, the biggest obstacle, you know, about getting a good program for MR urography is getting an interested radiologist. And the radiologist, it's not the, really just the radiologist. You know, we have a, PhD, PhD physicist that goes through all of these studies. They, can, you know, they don't come in and get to study and see us that day. They come back a week later because of all the post-processing that's needed for these studies. And um, so Damien Gratton Smith is our uh, radiologist, and um, and he um, and our physicist, um, one's Australian, one's British. Uh, the physicist does all this high risk stuff like mountain climbing and you know hang gliding and stuff. It always makes me so nervous when he goes away because if he wasn't there, um, we wouldn't have any of this, Richard Jones. And um, we, um, we have, as I said, two hospitals. Richard only goes to one of them and we can't do this stuff at the other hospital. They tried to, they just don't, they can't do it. So, you know, so some hospitals have done a pretty good job at doing this and some have, they do it, but the quality is not so great. Uh, but it's still better than what we had. So, so I have a good. Um, thank you for such a fascinating talk and making us all learn. Uh, so, as an adult person, there's one thing that you didn't mention here that we see an adult with you is that four-letter word P A I N. You know, you guys are looking for function of the kidney. It's great. You're looking at GFR. You're looking at anatomy, but. I was wondering if any of this technology can be correlated to that patient reported outcome of pain with a AI, would any of these things be correlated with, because you know, they come to us and they want their pain gone. And this is where we struggle. It's tough, you know, we, we only deal with pain in the teenagers pretty much. You know, none of our patients complain of pain until they get to about five or six, they have an EKG, but then we see that the flying pain, the, you know, the tiny stones with the severe pain, the hospitalizations, and those are difficult. So it depends what you think is causing the pain. We're all taught that pain happens when you have acute stretch of the renal capsule, right? And all the nerves around it, the, they're the same as the GI tract, so you get nausea and vomiting. Is that could be measured by an asymmetry index? I, I don't know. But the, the, the biggest problem, of course, is that this 
they're never in pain when you're doing these studies. You know, so you're not gonna get a, a stat MRU, you know, to figure this out, but there may be other ways of doing it. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, keenly think about all the time in ordering MRIs on people with even slightly compromised yeah. renal function. Uh, we've started to use Dotorem here. Do you use that in kids? What was that? Dotorem, a new gadolinium contrast? No, we, we just used the one that I've been showing you. We haven't used any other ones. My understanding is there's never been a case, this is maybe a couple months old data, but there's never been a case of uh, NSF with this new contrast, yeah. Dotorem. Well, there's never been a case of even using it at our institution. The problem is only it is like one case, and then the FDA, FDA is all over it. So, uh, yeah, we, I don't think we've I don't think we've changed our agent since we started. And when you do a Mag three study on a kid, let's say over two, do you ever have to give them any type of sedation at all, or not for Mag not for Mag threes? No. Well, I hope that was uh, useful for everybody, and thank you again very much.